It was the spring semester of the academic year, and I was in trouble. Over the course of long weeks that stretched into months, I fell deeper into discouragement until eventually I wondered whether I had the will to live. I'm talking about me, not somebody else, and I'm talking about last semester, the spring semester of 2014. And most of you don't know anything about this, which is why I've given my title this morning in the words of the old African-American spiritual, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Some of you know I don't talk about myself all that much in chapel. I'm mainly here to tell you about Jesus. But sometimes talking about me can be a way of helping you understand Jesus, and maybe this is one of those times. You see, in my chapel addresses this year, I want to tell you the stories of men and women from the Bible who were in all kinds of trouble. People like Isaiah, Ruth, Jeremiah, Elijah. Some of them lost loved ones. Some of them were filled with guilt and shame. Some experienced poverty and brokenness, had a family crisis, went through some other painful trial that tested their faith. For some, it was even a matter of life and death. I'm calling my series, When Trouble Comes. And what I want to learn is how God helped these people. What did they do when they were in a time of trouble and how did God deliver them? I'm interested in this partly for my own benefit. In fact, all of the things that I teach from the scriptures, it really comes out of things that I think will be healthy for me and my own spiritual experience, but it's also for your benefit because I know that you will be in trouble too. In fact, I suppose some of you are in trouble right now. Even if nobody knows the trouble you've seen, you are weighed down by guilt and shame, grieving the loss of home or relationship, facing an uncertain future perhaps. And even if you're not in trouble right now, cheer up because you will be. <laughs> Sooner or later, and it will help you immensely to know what godly people do when trouble comes and what God does to help them. And so I want to tell you stories from the Bible of people who could express their life testimony in the words of our year verse from a Psalm of David. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. But before I tell you any of those stories, as I will do in coming months, I want to tell you some of my own story, especially what helped me make it through. I won't be able to tell you all of the reasons why I was in trouble, because some of those reasons are connected to other people's stories, and I need to respect that. But I can tell you what it felt like to be in trouble. To borrow a few lines from the English poet George Herbert, I live to show his power who once did bring my joys to weep, and now my griefs to sing. In a strange way, what happened to me could almost have been an answer to prayer. You see, someone very close to me, someone I love more than life itself, was going through a time of real trouble. And those troubles came with feelings of such terrifying fear and painful sadness that life no longer seemed worth living. Sufferings far beyond anything that I had ever experienced in my own life. And so I asked God to lift her burden and insofar as possible, if possible, to let me carry some of that burden instead. Lord, she's too little, I said. She doesn't understand what's happening to her. Let me take whatever pain you want to give in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes you have prayers that you wish God wouldn't answer, but this time maybe he did. All I know is that in the weeks and months that followed, my beloved's burden gradually lifted and my joys were turned to sorrow. Now, my day job has plenty of challenges to begin with. I'm tempted to agree with the scholar from the University of Virginia who made a survey of leadership in higher education and concluded that the American college presidency is beyond the ability of anyone to do the job. 
balancing the budget, handling delicate personnel matters, caring for students in danger, facing legal accusations, responding to angry letters, trying to raise tens of millions of dollars, making crucial hiring decisions, handling attacks from the media, that's all in a day's work. Thankfully, I don't do any of those things alone. There are lots of people who work with me to do all of that. And ordinarily, those are all burdens, honestly, I can bear without losing too much sleep. Otherwise, I'm not sure I could do this job. But my beloved's sufferings affected me very deeply. Her burdens made me anxious about the future. I had feelings of overwhelming sadness. Truthfully, mornings when I cried, most of the time I was getting ready for the day. In the wise providence of God, I faced other troubles too, heavy burdens too private to share, at least in detail, but broken relationships, multiple attacks on my character, painful experiences from the past. I'm not sure it was the best semester for me to go through my 360 degree performance review and get honest feedback about my leadership from hundreds of faculty, staff, alumni, and students. All of this left me feeling sad and sometimes anxious. There were nights when I had trouble sleeping, that's rare for me, mornings when I was up well before dawn, days when it was very hard to get up and face the day. I doubt I was very good company. I'm sad about that as I think about that. There were, my problems were taking so much emotional energy that it was hard to be with people for very many hours at a time. I remember that on Easter Sunday of all days when we had a house full of guests, there were times, multiple times during the day when I felt like I just needed to go and be alone just to make it through the day. Mrs. Riken helpfully suggested that I should go to the doctor during all of this. They started by running through their checklist for emotional health. I scored badly, really badly, and it was humbling. I began to struggle with whether God loved me or not. Another new experience for me. I would read God's promises, but then doubts would creep in as to whether I really qualified. I would try to take comfort in a verse like this. This was one of them. For example, Psalm 86, verse 2, Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. But the problem with that, of course, is that if you're not very godly to begin with, and if you're having trouble trusting, it's easy to see that there's no guarantee then that God would save you. I could feel that I was in a downward spiral. One day I said to myself, you know, I understand why people kill themselves. A few days after that, I started to wonder how I would end it all. if. You know, it wasn't a thought I wanted to have, but Satan was after me. He was tempting me. Things were moving in a bad direction. And at the rate they were going, who, who knew how long it would be before I was in real danger? Those were some of the troubles I've seen, not all of them by any means. I guess by now I could change my title to everybody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> What I want to tell you is that God did not abandon me, but rescued me. My loving Heavenly Father, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the comforting, helping Holy Spirit brought me safely through. I can't say my troubles are over. I can't say that feelings of despair will never return. But I can say what David said, the Lord is my stronghold in time of trouble. I wonder, would you like to know some of the things that really helped me? There are things that, that maybe could help you. The first was this. I knew that what I was going through was totally and completely normal. I can't ever remember struggling with serious doubts about the love of God or with feelings of such despair, but that itself is unusual. The bitterness I briefly tasted is something that most Christians go through sooner or later, and some Christians struggle with for a lifetime. I know this from the experience of close friends and family members, 
I also know it from the history of the church. Here's just one example. It's from the life of the great London preacher, Charles Spurgeon, who struggled with depression over decades of ministry. He well knew that preachers he respected told their congregations not to give way to feelings of depression. But Spurgeon said, if those who blame quite so furiously could once know what depression is, they would think it cruel to scatter blame where comfort is needed. There are experiences of the children of God which are full of spiritual darkness. And I am almost persuaded, Spurgeon said, that those of God's servants who have been most highly favored have nevertheless suffered more times of darkness than others. That was certainly Spurgeon's own experience. And of course, we see the same thing in scripture. Job was tempted to curse God and die. Isaiah was undone. David was downcast. Jeremiah cursed the day that he was born. We'll learn more from all of their stories. These men were not weak or rebellious. They were simply weighed down by the ordinary burdens of life and ministry. It happened to them in their place. It could happen to people on this campus. Even Jesus went through a dark night of the soul when he wondered if there was some alternative to his cross and an afternoon of agony when he felt forsaken by the Father. We'll look at his story this year too. And all of this leads me to accept that seasons of doubt and discouragement and depression are a normal part of life in a fallen world. When trouble comes to you, it doesn't mean that you're a bad Christian. It doesn't mean that God is against you, although sometimes it may feel that way. In my time of trouble, it helped me to know that I was going through something that happens to most of God's beloved children. Another thing that helped me was trying to live a normal everyday life. There were days when that was extremely difficult, but I tried to do it as well as I could. I didn't have much of an appetite but I made sure that I ate something healthy every day. I pushed myself to get physical exercise even when I didn't have a lot of energy. Praise God for intramural soccer. <laughs> Thank you, Reichenators, you saved my life. <laughs> Getting regular exercise did a number of things. It gave me some times when my focus was off of all of my troubles. It strengthened me physically and I think also therefore emotionally. I tried to be present for my children. Recitals, concerts, baseball games, rides to and from school, family dinner, bedtime. Some of the memories of those days I think will stay with me for a lifetime. Caroline and I sang hymns and songs together at bedtime. Some of the best times of worship I have ever had. Our hearts were breaking and yet we were able to worship. Catherine. Join me for early morning bird walks in the springtime, and I could see God's beauty in the swallow on the wing. I could see his joy in the warbler in the sunshine. I could see his wisdom in the great horned owls that we saw brooding up in the oak tree. And what is more, I was blessed by her companionship, my daughter's ministry of presence to me. I went to worship. That's a part of normal everyday life for the Christian. I was in church on Sunday mornings. I was here in chapel during the week. I try to be here every day that I'm on campus. I didn't always feel very much like worshiping. Christians don't always, you know. But that was another place where God met me. And particularly through the words of hymns and songs that expressed God's grace for my need, they became so meaningful to me, like these words from Johann Frank. Though the earth be shaking, every heart be quaking, Jesus calms my fear. Lightnings flash and thunders crash, yet though sin and hell assail me, Jesus will not fail me. Those are the kinds of words that help when you're in time of trouble. And of course, I did my work at the college. That's part of everyday life for me, five, six days a week. I didn't quit. I kept up the ordinary routines of daily life, food and drink, work and play, family and worship. All of these things helped and friends helped too. And I need to say, and 
hopefully you'll understand the practical application of this for you. One of the reasons they were able to help is because I shared what was happening in my life. I didn't share everything with everybody, of course. I mean, who would even want to know all my troubles? But I did tell people what I was going through. I talked to my parents. I spoke with some of my very closest friends. I shared my struggles with the college presidents who are part of the Christian College Consortium, 12 colleagues in life and ministry. And of course, every day I talked over my troubles with my best friend, that girl from Colorado on One West that I fell in love with here at college. Very importantly, I made sure that the trustees knew how much pressure I was under. That was important for me. It was also important for the college. I needed to respect the leadership that God has placed over me, which includes not pretending everything is going well when it isn't. Some of the burdens I was bearing needed pastoral oversight. We turned to couples in ministry who have known us for a long time and will still love us a long time after we leave Wheaton. The point is that burdens are never meant to be carried alone. And I simply reflect on all of the people that I needed to help me. How would you ever make it if you didn't even speak to one person about the trouble that you were in? If you are having a problem, tell a brother or sister you trust. Confide in somebody who's been given a responsibility of spiritual care in your life. It's an important part of healthy life in the body of Christ. I was helped by small kindnesses, like the text my son Josh sent me offering to help me any way he could, or the card with the sunshine on the front that the ladies in my office left on my desk. One afternoon, when I was having despairing thoughts, I stepped out of a meeting to be alone for a few, few minutes. And in the providence of God, just right at that moment, one of my closest friends called to find out how I was doing. It was John Dennis, it's Julia's father. I, I'm mentioning these people because I wanna honor them this morning. I told him I felt like I was losing the will to live. Saying that put things in perspective, and just even saying it loosened the power of self-destructive thoughts. But what made an even bigger difference is that John told me he loved me, and I knew this was true. We grew up together. He's always been a faithful friend to me. It made such a huge difference in my life for him to tell me right at that moment that he loved me, which I don't think he would have said unless he knew how much trouble I was in, which he wouldn't have known unless I had told him. My friends also prayed for me. That's another thing that helped a lot. When trouble comes, there is nothing like the power of prayer. Many people pray for me every day. That is so humbling. People I don't even know, but they have a commitment to Wheaton College and that calls them to prayer. And so I get letters from people, including some of your parents who tell me that they pray for me daily or weekly. And do you know that every Thursday morning, I suppose it'll start tomorrow, there's a group of godly women who gathers just a few blocks from here and they spend a morning in prayer for all of us. What a huge difference that prayer meeting makes to the life of Wheaton College. In my time of trouble, I guess I needed even more prayer. I certainly needed to know that people were praying for me. I missed a meeting with my cabinet, as I occasionally do. Later, I learned they spent an extended time in prayer, specifically for my protection. The trustees were praying for me as well. Many of them sent personal notes of encouragement. In fact, at a certain point, I, I sent out a message to thank them for their encouragement. and. Immediately, all of the trustees that hadn't written a note yet realized that they hadn't written a note, and they wanted to write a note too, which was great. <laughs> One night, my mother and father laid their hands on me. And as he prayed, my father remembered what King Hezekiah did. And it was really hard for me to choose which stories I would tell you this year. I'm not going to tell that story, but it's a great story. What King Hezekiah did when the Assyrians surrounded Jerusalem and sent a letter that threatened the people of God with total destruction. You know that story? Hezekiah took 
the letter and he spread it out before the Lord. That's what my father said he was doing with my troubles in prayer. He spread them before the Lord. All of those prayers helped. But I wanted you to know that some of the deepest encouragement came from my Wheaton classmates. Most of them only knew some of the troubles that I was facing, but that was enough to mobilize them for intercession. My freshman roommate, Steve Snezek, sent me a note to say that he was praying for me. Jimmy Favino, who played football here, he teaches high school English now, he sent me an email to say that he was going to spend the next day in fasting and prayer just for me. Mrs. Reichen and I learned that our friends, the Nussbaums and the Garretts, many of you will know Barb from Student Activities Office, they were meeting on Sunday nights to pray for us. I can hardly express how much it means to me that so many people cared enough to pray for me, and particularly those long-standing friendships were so meaningful. I was in deep distress. They covered me with petitions and with benedictions, righteous prayers that were a powerful instrument of God's grace in my life. This morning, I wonder, who is the close friend who is in need of your prayers? Meanwhile, I was praying too, and in my prayers, I told God exactly what I was thinking, just like Job did when he was afflicted. Sometimes I didn't know what to ask. I couldn't really form the words of an intelligible petition. I could only say, help me, Jesus. That's a prayer I like a lot. Or this one from the gospel, son of David, have mercy on me. Sometimes I could only groan, literally. But the Holy Spirit understands our inner struggles so well, he is able to translate even groaning into prayer. Do you know this scripture? We do not know what to pray for as we ought. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 26. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Sometimes I wondered what sense the Holy Spirit could make of my anguished soul. I only knew that when trouble came, the Holy Spirit was turning groaning into prayer at the throne of my Father's grace. And then let me tell you one more thing that helped the Word of God the Bible, the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. I treasured the verses that my mother sent to me from the Psalms of David. On the day I called you, you answered me. My strength of soul increased. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures Forever, all of those verses from Psalm 138 may be something to note and look at later. Some of my best memories are the times that Lisa and I had late at night when she would read Psalms over me until I fell asleep. And those words quieted my anxious spirit, the true words of God. One of the main ways that God becomes an ever-present help to us in times of trouble is by speaking truth to our minds and hearts, which is why I think it is so helpful for me to give this series of chapel messages so that we can see from Scripture the help that God has for us in times of trouble. Because I know, let me say it again, that you will be in trouble too. It might even happen this school year in ways you can hardly imagine right now. Could it be that you will suffer the sudden loss of someone you love, that you will struggle with a sin that you can't seem to get rid of, that you will experience the pain of a broken relationship, that there'll be problems in your family, things that you didn't even understand until you came here that no one can seem to fix? Maybe this is a year you will have to give up one of your dreams for college, for life, Maybe you'll have serious doubts about how God will provide for your needs. Maybe you'll have serious doubts about things that always seem very simple for you to believe, but suddenly you doubt. Maybe you'll be overwhelmed with academic pressures or perhaps be tempted to hate yourself or even despair of life itself. What will you do when trouble comes? 
I think the things that helped me will also help you, maybe even more than you know. The basic things of life, a good night's sleep, a healthy meal, going to church, talking with a faithful friend, meeting with God through prayer, meditating on his word. And the reason all of these things help is because they are God's gifts to you in Jesus Christ. When I tell you what helped me in my time of trouble, I'm not just sort of giving a list of practical tips about something. I am telling you all the ways that Jesus ministered to me in his grace. Our bodies are the gift of his wisdom and his creative power. What we do in the body is an instrument of his work in our lives. Whenever we sit down to eat a meal, we are hosted by his providence. Work is a gift from Jesus, even academic work. Play is another gift. And then afterwards, a good night of rest. Jesus has given us to one another, particularly in the context of worship. And that's an encouragement to us. It's a gift from Jesus. He sent his spirit to help us pray. And most of all, he's given us life through his death and resurrection. It's all God's grace to us in Jesus Christ. And so what I am saying to you this morning is the same thing David said which I commend to your meditation this year. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He saves them because they take refuge in him. That is my testimony this morning in Jesus' name. And I hope so very much that it will be your testimony as well. Our Father in heaven, we give you praise that you are a God of grace in times of trouble. I think this morning of the promise of Jesus, I will never leave you or forsake you. It's a promise Jesus makes to all of his disciples, to each one of us here this morning. Lord, we don't know what trouble this year may bring, but we testify together this morning that you are sufficient, you are able to bring deliverance, you are able to be a stronghold and a refuge you are a rescuing, saving God. And so we commend ourselves to your care this morning. And we would also ask for the grace to be ministers and servants of your help to others in their time of trouble. It's for Jesus' sake and in his name that we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.